Hey, Brittany here. And I'm Claire. And you're listening to Eco Curious, a podcast dedicated to bringing interesting, relevant, and local science to the masses. This podcast is created by the Petty Kodiak Watershed Alliance, a nonprofit environmental organization based in Moncton, New Brunswick. Thank you again for having us. It's been a pleasure I, to show you around. That's awesome. It's been a pleasure for us to be here outside of our office. So our first question is, how do ticks spread geographically? Are ticks hitching a ride on animals, for example? Yeah, so ticks are a fairly recent addition to this part of the world, Maritimes anyway. Uh, ticks travel, that an individual tick on its own will not travel much. Uh, they've got really tiny short legs, so they'll maybe move perhaps a meter over the course of its life. Wow. But um, if it finds a wild animal, say a mouse, it'll grab onto the mouse and the mouse will, over the course of its foraging for food, can move at many hundreds of meters. Now that's not very far, but if it then grabs onto a deer, a deer will have a much longer home range so Mm. it can travel further distances. The longest traveling a tick will do is when it finds itself on a bird, and particularly a migratory bird that is migrating, and that's able to allow ticks to travel between continents, and within continents we have ticks that can travel across the Atlantic Ocean, on the other side of the country across the Pacific. So that's the tick version of flying first class Air Canada. You can be a worldwide traveler that way. I suppose that is an interesting way to look at it. That's amazing. So these ticks must have a really good grasp on these migratory birds if they're being able to like hold on and not fall off as they're being flown from continent to <laughs> yes, continent. Yes, really. Yeah, that, well, the, what the ticks are doing is they're, eat, they're feeding the whole time the bird is flying. When the tick feeds, it'll feed for several days, often a week or longer. So it, its head is essentially a sp- a spiky harpoon with points going backwards. So it shoves its mouth parts into the host and it injects an anesthetic so the host doesn't feel it. It's not itchy or anything. That's why people don't feel ticks. Um, And then it's just sucking blood. Yeah. And it's gonna suck blood for the entire time. The bird won't notice it. It may not, it's not probably not gonna spend a lot of time preening because it's busy flying. Yeah. And that harpoon keeps it tethered. They also secrete a kind of cement that glues it onto the skin. Oh, just Amazing. in case so yeah. everything else doesn't exactly. secure the ride. Wow. So That's incredible. For our listeners, can you just briefly explain what Lyme disease is and how ticks can become a carrier of Lyme disease? Okay, so the problem with ticks is no one would actually care that much about ticks no. if they didn't transmit disease. Maybe similar to a mosquito almost. Yeah, Just they'd sucking be, our blood and not yeah. harming us in any other yeah, way. Yeah, it, it'd be annoying. Uh, unlike a mosquito, it wouldn't be an itchy bite. Yeah. So, but it's That's the right. diseases that make it a problem. Uh, the ticks harbor more pathogenic bacteria and viruses than any other small arthropod, so a bug there are the winners there and they have a whole (laughs) bunch of diseases Lyme disease is the most common one and it's sort of the linchpin disease because the bacteria the Lyme disease bacteria plus the tick saliva can both suppress your immune system so that if you get that plus something else all the pathogens in the tick can really get hold of in get a good hold of your body and make you very ill So the way ticks give you Lyme disease is for the most common type of Lyme disease, a tick is not born infected. It gets infected when it's a baby tick and you saw the little young ticks. And that baby tick gets a meal from a mouse. Now if that mouse is infected, then the tick will become infected. Then that tick comes and finds you or your dog or your cat. And while it's feeding, it's sucking up your blood. Now your blood's mostly water, the tick doesn't want the water, it wants the proteins and the cells in that. So it sucks your blood and then it sieves out all the stuff it wants and it's left with a bunch of water. It can't pee it out the back end because then you'd notice all this water on your skin. So it does the obvious thing for a tick which is it squirts the water back into you. 
So you're a snack plus you're the tick sewer, making you feel good about it. While it's squirting the water from your blood back into you, it picks up all the bacteria and viruses that were in the tick and they go into your body from the tick. I see. Now if we look at it from a reverse perspective, can a human transmit a bacteria to a tick? That can happen. Um, it happen. It's more of a problem for wild animals and pets because there are more ticks. But if you do have an infection, you can give it to a tick if you're unlucky to have that many ticks on you. The most interesting application of that problem is called xenodiagnosis, and it's a process where to figure out if someone has Lyme disease, if the blood test isn't working, if there's really no other way of detecting it, mm -hmm. they shove ticks that they know are uninfected on the person, and the ticks concentrate the bacteria from the person's blood, then they take the tick off, and then a tick is a very small, concentrated place, yeah. and you can identify the bacteria inside the tick. That's fascinating. Whoa. Incredible. So all you have to do is tolerate having a few hundred baby ticks on you for a week. How often is that diagnosis used? It's uh, only been used in a research setting so far. Okay. For the most part, the diagnosis relies on the blood test, which has a lot of problems with it. Um, so if you have an experienced doctor, they'll do a clinical diagnosis, basically looking at your exposure history, your symptoms, and then use their judgment to say what they think it is. Interesting. All right. Um, moving on, we understand you're currently researching Lyme disease in your laboratory. Um, what's the uh, current objective of your research? We're looking at, with the tick work, we're looking at the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. We're also looking at many of the other bacteria that cause the different, different diseases. So different, the ticks carry a number of bacteria, so we're looking at a number of them. And the objective of that research is just to figure out exactly what's in this region. So we need to know what pathogens are in the ticks because those pathogens can end up in people, in pets, and then that becomes medically important. So that's a very straightforward what's there, so we know what to look for. And that ideally provides support for the physicians and support for the people who are making the tests that detect Lyme disease and other diseases. We also test uh, blood from horses and dogs and cows and cats and various other animals uh, to see what the exposure is like in this area, and we test wildlife, uh, particularly wildlife that happens to get itself killed. Roads are a very powerful and important predator, but it provides us with a good source of material of a lot of different wildlife species, and then we can look in their body to find out where the bacteria is spreading and what kind of damage it has done in the body. Wow, that sounds quite extensive, so you'll kind of do a, an autopsy of roadkill. Yes, yeah. And, and a lot of the damage, is, the, the gross damage is caused by hitting a transport truck. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. looking at the cellular level, you can see what kind of damage to the liver or the kidneys or the joints has been done by the bacteria. So those oh. are the main targets for um, this bacteria, is the liver, kidney, and joints? Uh, it actually seems to be pretty much everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, okay. A lot of, and the brain, those. But yeah. those are probably the big, biggest The big organs. targets. Right. So uh, we understand that you get funding to provide uh, tick testing for those who send in samples to the lab. Um, so are many people taking advantage of this and is your lab drowning in ticks, so to speak? Uh, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people in New Brunswick are taking advantage of it. New Brunswick is one of the better provinces in terms of tick testing because if you have a tick on you as a human, uh, if you get it taken off in the hospital, they'll test it through the medical system. Uh, if you have a tick on a pet, that mostly goes to your veterinarian, which generally comes to me. Uh. But in most other provinces, uh, there is no other tick form of tick testing. So we actually get ticks from pretty much Ontario eastwards. 
And yeah, we're getting a lot. There are a lot more in this region. Every year we get more ticks come in and every time uh, there's no other testing available and say Ontario cut back on their testing that we get the surplus there. So why do you think this service is not yet available in the other provinces? It's not so much yet. Uh, it was available and it's been re eliminated. There are a couple reasons for that. One, the obvious one is cost cutting. The slightly more involved region is that that testing was done for surveillance. They wanted to know if there were ticks there. The moment they've decided, yep, there really are ticks here, they don't need to test the ticks anymore because they've found their answer. But the problem is that if you have a tick on you, you want to know, is that particular tick infected or not? Mm -hmm. You don't really care, well, yeah, I know there are ticks in the region, but I want to know about my tick. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So if a tick uh, would be infected with Lyme disease, what are the symptoms that a human would see rather than an animal? Um, the symptoms are actually surprisingly similar. Uh, with the exception that most animals have a stronger immune system, so they're better able to deal with it. So, one thing that's important is that the tick has to feed for a while. It takes a while to get enough blood in to that they have to start squirting it into your body and the bacteria have to be prepared to go into your body. So that takes some time. There's a lot of argument about how much time. I, 24 hour, it used, they, it used to be thought that it was 72 hours, then it was dropped to 48. Currently, most people are saying 24 hours. To be safe. Yeah, yeah. that it doesn't really happen before right. that. There are certainly exceptions where it'll happen before 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So the, short, the safe version is to say that the longer the tick on, the sooner you get the tick off you, the better. Right. And the longer it's on, the more dangerous it is. So if it's infected and if it's fed from you for long enough, one of the symptoms you're going to see as a human are fairly nonspecific and that's a bit of a problem. People can get a short-term fever, feel a bit achy, it feels like you've got a flu. Could be food poisoning. Um, sometimes people get a rash, not everyone gets a rash. Um, would the rash be localized to where the tick is, or would it just be all over? Um, initially, it's where the tick around okay. where the tick is, and everyone talks about the bullseye rash. And if you go on Wikipedia, yeah. you see a beautiful big bullseye rash. Right. They don't usually look like that. Sometimes they do. What they causes go that okay. bullseye rash when it does happen occasionally? When it does happen, that is your body's immune, that's caused by the bacteria spreading out of the tick and it spreads in your skin. Um, and that is also related to where the tick bites you and how deeply it bites into you. Mm -hmm. But if those bacteria are migrating in the skin instead of going straight into your circulatory system or your lymphatic system, then your immune system will react and it'll make a way, some redness. And that happens in waves as your immune system responds. So those are your immune cells creating that red yeah. ring? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So if you see that red ring, that's perversely, people who have the bullseye rash are called lucky because nothing else will cause a rash that looks just like that. Yeah. Ringworm kind of looks a bit, but not really. Mm. But if you are, have so, are someone with pigmented skin, if your immune system doesn't respond to it, if it's in your hair, um, no rash or you don't see the rash. If you're a dog, um, no rash because of the fur thing happening. Right, <laughs> right, the fur. Yeah, of course. Um, so the, fr the rash is not inevitable. So you've got some, a rash that doesn't always form, a fever that doesn't always happen which is not much to go for in clues. Once the bacteria disseminate through your body, then you start getting things like arthritis that moves around your body. So joint pain, sometimes it's one knee and then all of a sudden that's bad for a few days and then it's over here, jumps to the other side. Interesting. Ah. Um, and then it progresses. It starts attacking your nervous system, your muscles, you get muscle pain numbness, tingling as your nervous system shuts down. It 
in very late stages, then it's going into the brain, which is not a great place to have bacteria. No. no. Liver, so. kidneys, other organs where you really don't want a ton of bacteria. Um, no. After it moves to your brain, would that be through the circulatory system in the blood? Correct? It's thought to be that it's actually traveling uh, along your nerves. Your nerves. So it's going up the spinal cord. And then could that kind of create a tumor? in the brain as the bacteria proliferates or would it just no they're not that localized but so they don't make big lumps okay. um and when it's in the brain it's associated with localized cell death uh in part because your brain's trying to fight it and so you're getting symptoms that look like dementia oh. and actually that's just being recognized by the world health organization as uh lyme, lyme borreliosis dementia the nice uh, thing, <laughs> if there's anything nice uh, about dementia, uh, is there is a treatment for that. Because if you put people on antibiotics, the bacteria will die, mm -hmm. and then your brain can do some repair. Oh, it would be very a small, right? Um, how much repair your brain could do after there's been significant cell death? It, it's actually uh, effective enough that people can resume their life. So it, it, that, it is considered treatable. Oh, what you incredible. have to do is that what you have to do is identify it first, as opposed to writing someone off and saying, eh, "Well, it's Alzheimer's. Sorry, we can't do anything with mm -hmm. good old Uncle Bob. We'll put him in a home." It's important to check that Uncle Bob didn't have a tick on him at some point. Interesting. So, uh, since you've done many interviews in the Maritimes concerning ticks, we're sure you've heard these questions before. <laughs> But You're actually asking different and interesting questions, so I'm enjoying <laughs> Thank this. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, but for listeners, how would you check for a tick on yourself? How should you remove a tick? And what should you do with the tick after it's been removed, which I've, we've already okay. talked about. It's an interesting Okay. Up. So step one, checking for the tick. Mm -hmm. The sooner you get it off you, the better. Right. So uh, I showed you a picture of a little small tick. They're tiny. Yes. So, so you're tiny. If we were to give um, a dimension yes. for our listeners, would we say around like one millimeter something in like diameter? That. So you're looking at smaller. something that can be as look roughly like a poppy seed yeah. or a freckle. Mm. But what you're looking for is a freckle with legs. And the freckles on your body normally don't come with legs. Mm. So at the end of the day, particularly after you've been out in the forest, if you've been working in the forest, out hiking, but even if you've been in your garden or sprawled out in a park, what you need to do is do a tick check. And it sounds very exotic, it isn't. You look at your body and you make a point of looking in all the nooks and crevices, and that can be embarrassing, but you get over it. If you don't have someone to help you with said nooks and crevices, a full length mirror will do the trick. Ah. <laughs> and it's a useful way of keeping track of any moles or other splotches that you might want to monitor too. And it's something that in the Maritimes, we just have to get used to. Ticks have been pre ticks are here, they're not going anywhere. Where ticks have been well established, people just get used to it. End of the day, brush your teeth, tick check, go to bed. And we have to start doing that. So, tick check. If you happen to find a tick, um, a fairly normal response is, ooh, gross, and having removed ticks from myself, I am working with them How every day. How many ticks have you removed from yourself? I'm, I'm up to six now. Six? Six. Is That's this just wow. from your, your field work? No, this is from my gardening. Your oh. garden? In my garden, so. I'm sure your garden huh. looks great if you spend so much time on it. No, I, I'm not even a brilliant gardener. <laughs> the field work is actually safer because we're dressed in full protective You're gear. You're protected for it. Uh, whereas gardening, I'm in wearing shorts, uh, which is the problem. So your once you get over the oh gross, that's disgusting instinct, and I do it too, you're going to want to remove the tick. You can use tweezers or there are specialized tick removal tools if you happen to have one handy. Most veterinarians sell them, but your regular pointy tweezers will do just fine. Mm -hmm. You grab the tick as close to the skin as you can, pull upwards slowly, steadily. Your skin is going to come up and you'll see exactly how well it's stuck there. Oh, your wow. skin come. it's, again, this is an, a, an oh yuck moment. And I'm a biologist, I'm and I still go, oh, yuck. This. The good news <laughs> is it doesn't hurt. 
because the tick injects an anesthetic. Yay. So you're just sitting there watching your skin go up and up and eventually the tick is pulled free. Well, that is kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. Now, once you got the tick out, um, while you're pulling, you don't want to squish the fat bloody bag of its stomach because that's going to squish, squish its guts back into you. So you're Ooh. grabbing, that's why you grab close to the skin. Oh, that's appetizing! Yeah, you have to be sure to show uh, to play this close to a, a meal time. <laughs> so you got the tick out. Good for you. Uh, you do not want to flush it down the toilet because you can test that tick, and that's a really good idea. You test it, you find out what's in it, as opposed to sitting there for the next four weeks saying, "Am I getting sick? Am I getting mm -hmm. sick? Oh, I feel a bit hot today. I'm getting sick." I'm convincing myself it's yeah. Yeah. So grab. Shove it in a Ziploc baggie, throw it in the freezer. Um, if you are a human, or if the tick came from a human, I was about to say, go on the internet. So, barring the cats who are watching <laughs> the internet. <laughs> uh, if the tick came from a human and you're east of Ontario, mm -hmm. you can go on the internet and check in to see if your local public health takes it. If you're in New Brunswick, the answer can be yes. Other places, the answer is no, in which case you can send it to my lab. So you want to send, and if none of that works, uh, most veterinarians will test it. They will charge a fee for it, but... Uh, it's worth it. It's probably worth it. Know. And the same is true if you have the tick from your dog and the cat. Uh, you pull it out the same way. It doesn't hurt them unless you grab a handful of fur. They don't like that. And you can decide whether, for a tick from a dog or a cat, you can decide whether or not you need to have it tested. Have the tick tested, you'll get the tick results, find out what the tick had in it, and you can either go, phew, I was lucky that time, no Lyme disease, or, hmm, well that's bad news. I need to go talk to my doctor to find out if it looks like the tick gave me a disease or not. The nice thing is you have time, there's usually several weeks, between the tick bite to when you get sick. And during that period, the bacteria haven't traveled very much inside your body, so a short course of antibiotics will get rid of it. Right. What you want to avoid is not detecting the disease and letting the bacteria travel through your whole body, because then they're really hard to get rid of and it's not gonna be doing you any good in the meantime. Right, so the antibiotics would be the treatment for early yeah. uh, caught Lyme disease. What is, do you know the mechanism of this antibiotic? Uh, there are a number of different antibiotics you can use. They all work by killing the bacteria. Ideally. So, yeah. so sometimes they kill it, sometimes they stop it from replicating and then it just right. dies. But basically it's a bacterial illness, so antibiotics work. But do you know the mechanism on the cellular level? Like, what part of the bacteria does it target? It depends on the antibiotic. <laughs> of course, um, right. So some of the most common ones uh, bind to the ribosome, which is used for, by the bacteria to make proteins so it can grow. And so it can't make proteins, it can't grow, it just sort of sti sits there, and if you are kind of frozen and can't grow for long enough, you will die. You die. Cool. Right. Um, so, how many of the ticks that you found in your body, were any of them carrying Lyme disease? Yeah. Of the six? Oh. Yeah. Uh, the first tick. Um, that's how I got Lyme disease. And the second one not, third one not, fourth and fifth. And I was lucky on the sixth. Wow. That's good. So. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> you say it so casually, I would be scared yeah. for life. Well. Yeah. After the first time, which made me very, very sick for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I, well, I'm better now, but uh, that I learned a lot very fast about the disease. Uh, yeah, you would learn the symptoms firsthand. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been very proactive and aggressive in treating any tick bites, which prevented the illness. So That's good. But I'm sure you having it once is more than adequate. More than enough. Yeah, I will take your word for it, certainly. Yeah, try to avoid it. Yeah. Um, in one of your recent publications, you are examining current and future deer tick distribution under climate change projections. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about the results found and elaborate a bit more on the relationship between warmer winter days, specifically above zero, and the occurrence of deer ticks? Yeah, um, so the ticks are an invasive species. 
And that requires two things. First of all, they have to be brought here, but the birds will do that job. And the birds have always been doing that job. And what's happened in the past is when we've had not so much colder winters, but longer winters, there hasn't been enough time, enough warm time for the tick to get through the necessary part of its life cycle. So it has to get food, molt, uh, get more food, find a mate, have babies. That all takes a certain amount of time. And if most of the ticks, if you've got snow through to the end of March, maybe June, um, and Which then we occasionally see here in their time. So yeah, 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 I think, uh, yeah. And then the snow starts again too early. Uh, there's not enough time. But what we're seeing is that the snow period is contracting. Mm -hmm. And whenever the temperatures above, say, about four degrees, ticks are active. They're quite happy in cooler temperatures. So they're, they're having enough time to complete their life cycle, which means boy finds girl, little, I don't know whether tick love ensues. What I do know is that eggs ensue, and a well-fed female tick can produce 2,000 to 5,000 eggs. Oh, me! <laughs> now, can ticks transmit the disease to each other while they're mating? Yes, they do, actually. Oh, okay. Um, at least for ticks, uh, Lyme disease is sexually transmitted. There is an argument whether it's sexually transmitted in mammals, but yes, oh. they do transmit it to each other. It doesn't okay. make much difference because the females don't transmit the classical Lyme disease to their eggs. The uh, different types of Lyme disease, there are many related bacteria that cause diseases that to the patient feel exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And some of those can be transmitted through the eggs. But very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Nauseating, yes. No, but yeah. interesting alongside, right? Uh, we understand your re in your research you have an interest in uh, genetics and epigenetics. Could yeah. you tell us the difference between this? What are those things? <laughs> what are those? <laughs> what are those? Uh, so genetics is DNA, so it's essentially what you inherit from your parents. And the cool thing about DNA is you also have some effect. The environment and your life experiences can modify the action of that DNA. Is that like a nature versus nurture? It is to some extent. Cool. So you're born with the DNA, but then you have proteins that stick to the DNA and tell your different genes whether to go on or off. And those proteins respond to the environment you've gone through. Did you get enough food? Not enough food? Do you have a really crappy diet and you're eating sugar and chemicals all the time? Um, all of your life experiences, not just did you see a sad movie, but something more profound, physiologically <laughs> relevant, is going to affect which genes are turned on. They affect the amount of hormones slopping around your body, which affect gene activity. So the fine tuning of your genes is epigenetics. Mm. So I'm interested in, with ticks, we've been looking so far just at genetics. So okay. what ticks are here? Are they breeding with each other? And it turns out ticks are little sex maniacs and they hybridize with each other at the drop of a hat. Mm. So oh, great. for our listeners, hybridization, can you explain what that is? Mm. Um, so normally we consider a species to be something that mates with other members of the same species but not mating between species. So you got a dog, which is a dog, and you got a cat that's a different species and you're going to be pretty comfortable that you're not going to have a cog or a dat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's that the spin-off dads. series Dog Cat, is that yeah. what it's called? Except nice. for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ticks come in species too and we've thought that you know ticks are supposed to be sensible enough that they only mate with other members of the same species but it turns out that they're fairly promiscuous so they will mate with other tick species which means that they can exchange genes between the incoming ticks and the ticks that have been here Ooh. which we think is having a physiological effect uh, in terms of the cold hardiness of the imported ticks. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of epigenetics, where we're looking at that is we're asking the question, do it, if a tick carries a certain bunch of bacteria, does it change that tick's behavior? 
And the answer seems there's some evidence in the United uh, from Europe and also the United States that depending which pathogens you affect, you carry it affects the tick and the information from Europe is actually really bad news, is that if you have Lyme disease as a tick, you're actually better off and better able to overwinter no than if you don't have Lyme disease, how, which helps in the spread. How did they monitor tick behavior? Is um, that in lab or? In a lab. In the lab the, setting? Yeah, primarily. primarily. Ticks don't really behave, they mostly just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for yourself personally, uh, what do you perform, prefer more, lab work or field work? And what is the most interesting part about lab work for you? Um, I like both, but I must admit that if I'm, if I'm forced to decide, I'm a lab person. Lab. Mm. And that's got a lot to do with the fact that I just don't like black flies. <laughs> oh, they're so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> so that's a, a decision I made early on in my life. Um, let's see, in the lab there are all the bugs, there are not fewer bugs, but the bugs are dead. So I consider that an asset. And in your control. Yes. I wouldn't have thought of it that way last <laughs> time. That's just me. Uh, we read in another one of your articles, Citizen Science and Community Engagement and Tick Surveillance, that you made use of citizen science for data collection. Could you tell us what is citizen science and how it was used to map tick's population? Yeah, so citizen science is when regular people who are just living regular lives uh, start observing the natural world and instead of just saying, hey, found a tick on my dog, throw it away, they're participating in a research study and it's used a lot in, in, natural, in the natural sciences, say a lot of bird groups, there's the Christmas bird count that a lot of people will have heard of. And people go out and record what birds they see. You can monitor the birds you see at your feeder. Um, there's the butterfly count. There's the lady beetle project. If you see a different uh, lady beetle, you take a picture of it, you send it in. And it helps biologists track where species are, keep track of bird populations, butterfly populations. So we use the same approach with ticks. If you see a tick, please send it to us. We'll send you back the results of the testing, so it's good for you too. But it helps us getting a lot of data about ticks, and it's the perfect world from my perspective because it means I don't have to run around New Brunswick finding every one of those ticks. Those ticks, unfortunately, have already found a human or a cat or a dog. That's unfortunate for the human, cat or dog but at least that way we know where the tick came from and then we can build maps, such as in the climate projection maps, mm -hmm. um, and then we can keep track of where they are. So it's actually a very sensitive way of monitoring tick populations. We have some amazing tick catchers out there. I think I featured a few of the star tick catchers in the paper. Um, I would say the two most prolific fetal catchers is a gentleman in Nova Scotia who goes out and uh, drags for ticks every few days. Just for fun? No. Yes. Okay. Um, what does he use um, to drag behind him to, ca to capture these ticks? A uh, towel or flannel cloth. So it's very low tech. Very low tech. Um, you're basically dusting the grass. Um, and he sends us the ticks and the information on where he found the ticks. We have uh, a lady in St. John who monitors her backyard every couple days and that's done for self-protection. She has two young children and she was not keen on finding ticks on her young children or herself. Uh, Does so she live in a rural or urban area? Uh, suburban, suburban, so sit, more or less city. But with, yeah, it's got a backyard. Wow. So she goes through her backyard very carefully, mm -hmm. and also her cat roams the backyard, and when cat, Kitty comes in, Kitty is, com is com checked very, very carefully for Whoa. these tiny ticks. That's and good. essentially then she sops up all the ticks in her backyard. It's safe for her kids. Mm -hmm. And then she's kind enough to give us the data, so we have really good high-density data. Awesome. Do you know how many ticks she has found personally, off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, over the past of three years, she hit three, 500 um, last year, and I haven't seen her count for this year. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And how large is her backyard? 
Um, I've been there, so it's it's a really nice backyard. I would say largish and well shrubbed, but I mean it's not huge. We're not talking an estate where you're galloping mm -hmm. your horse around. <laughs> the Versailles Garden. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not the Versailles Garden. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna stop hanging out in my backyard. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, or no, you could do citizen science. Or I'll do. Yeah. I'm inspired. Science. I don't know. About so, you. so this is one thing that's really important is that we can't stop going outside because there are icky, scary things outside. Yes. Yes. We have to enjoy it. Uh, we just have to enjoy it sensibly, which is yes. to recognize their ticks now. So go enjoy your backyard mm -hmm. and then check yourself for ticks and send them to me. Or enjoy your backyard in a hazmat suit. <laughs> <laughs> we don't live in Australia. Get a nice tan. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, they're, you get really hot and sweaty. In them. Yes, that's true. Well, so as we've covered, diseases carried by ticks are becoming more of a concern in New Brunswick, and you have clearly been a voice from the scientific community to offer facts about tick-borne diseases. So what impact do you hope to make by sharing your knowledge? Um, I would hope that essentially what I've just said is that the ticks are here to stay. Mm -hmm. We can't hide from them because then we're not going to enjoy our province, which is an amazing place. Mm. Um, I am actually a big fan of New Brunswick. I think this province is grossly underappreciated, but that's okay because mm -hmm. we can enjoy it all ourselves that mm -hmm. way. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful province. We've got many beautiful places to be, so you have to go outside and enjoy it. Um, and then you have to, at the end of the day, do a tick check. Yes. Nice. So should we keep that in mind then going forward? I think we're going to have to get used to it. It's just going to become part of our routine, brush your teeth, check for ticks. Mm -hmm. Right. You but can make it fun. Yeah, of course, but don't let it uh, stop your fun. Absolutely and not. enjoy everything that New Brunswick has to offer. I agree. Yeah. That's lovely. Well, uh, we've kept you for a while and okay. I guess we're getting close to it. Um, yeah, I'll probably have to take off in five minutes. I <laughs> did have an extra question, if you cool. have a second. Yeah. I, I noticed that you did your uh, Master's of Science equivalent at the University of Geneva. Yep. Considering Switzerland's huge role worldwide in sustainability, what was different about living there than New Brunswick? The pollution. <sighs> really? Yeah. I mean, people think of Switzerland as gorgeous Alps and... That's exactly what I picture. Maybe a dude in 100%. lederhosen blowing an Alpen horn. Oh, that does sound fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I admit I never saw a man in lederhosen blowing an Alpen horn. I did see people vacuuming the sidewalk, which... Really? Yes. Which is one of the more remarkable sights. <laughs> but very Swiss. Um, but it's very high density, so they're ah. being sustainable because they have to, uh, and their leadership role is really important worldwide, but it, they're being driven to it, and the level of pollution that people have to live with, I think, is something most North Americans don't consider. Perhaps if you're mm. in Los Angeles or Vancouver, where they have, or Toronto, where you deal with smog advisories regularly, but. Yeah, that, sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. That's great. No pristine no. mountains. What kind of pollution are we talking about? Like air uh, pollution? Yeah, air pollution mostly. Yeah. I, I, who knows what's in the waterways? Many of the rivers were sort of bubbly and funny colored. Oh, that's Ooh, fun. Funny colored? Yeah. Like dark brown or a different color? Uh, no, one of them was remarkably purple. Oh, purple. purple. Yeah, you don't want that. No, I wouldn't imagine. No, I was kind of thinking more kind of bluey green or maybe just clear we can go for clear mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. that's interesting oh. no thank, thank you, you so much. much for your time this is so a fascinating much. interview <laughs> yes. well I, I enjoyed it you guys ask different questions so thank you I'm very so much i'm so glad for that. to hear that <laughs> <laughs> i'm so thrilled thank you so thank so, you. so much